hold on, let me pull that down. You can see the tech stuff isn't as good when I'm doing it. Uh, 12 here, we're getting very close to the end of the course. After this, we just have four more and that extra one on Buddhism. But we still are in the early modern period here. So here we are, we're gonna look at Milton, Marvel, and Herbert. Regarding that, Herbert um, apparently is not in the course reader and neither is Upon Appleton House by Marvel, which I'm briefly gonna talk, or gonna talk a little bit about today. So um, no worries, just what I cover in class is sufficient. You don't need to like try to find them somewhere, anything like that. So um, this is John Martin, uh, Raphael Visits Eden. This is his depiction of Paradise Lost. I just give it to you because even though it's coming later, 1825, Paradise Lost, the most um, complete version is published in 1674. I think it still wonderfully depicts what Milton's trying to do here. Small human presence, that's Raphael the angel visiting Adam and Eve but it's a very interesting looking Eden here. It's very much a wilderness place. You can see it's not a, quite a pastoral place. And I think Milton is moving in that direction too. So just to visually kind of depict Milton. So let's do our first poll. Curious about this. Oops. Okay. Have you been keeping up with the course readings? So uh, did you finish the readings for this lecture? Of course, not including upon Appleton House and Herbert's Man, but um, are you a little behind and where are you? And I get to see if you're a little behind maybe because of course, um, you know, you just finished the midterm not that long ago and you'll catch up when it comes near the, um, so interesting curve there, kind of a perfect curve. Most people are a little behind or are keeping up anyhow. So good to know. But again, you know, it's not the end of the world if you're not because you really won't get tested on this till the final exam. And this isn't something that shows up like in the, um, the comments. So Cooper's Hill is that highly dis local descriptive poem that sort of inaugurates the genre of local, local descriptive poetry. Uh, certainly Milton's Paradise Lost coming a few uh, decades later, not that long really, just two or three decades later. Um, you know, all the description here, betwixt them lawns or level downs and flocks gracing the tender herb were interposed on palmy hillcock or the flowery lap of some um, irrigorous valley spread her store, flowers of all hue and without thorn the rose. So what's he trying to do here? Well, by 17th century standards, he's certainly trying to um, make it so you can visualize this, you can see it, you can imagine it. There are even smells here. We're gonna see more of this when we, we get to someone like Thoreau, but even here, you can see, close your eyes and you can kind of imagine what this place is like. And um, again, you, you couldn't have done that with either upon Appleton House, um, I'm sorry, um, the description of Cookham or to Penshurst. I hear some people talking, thank you. So um, it's, it's an early example of the power of loco descriptive literature. Is Paradise Lost like a quintessential nature poem? No, it's not, it's doing something else, but it clearly is in the genre of something trying to describe nature and a good example of it. And you can see, even though Denham just starts this a couple of decades earlier, by the time we get to here, it's already, this is a juggernaut that is moving through the style of English literature. And, and, and why is it the case? Because you know you, you can't gesture to Eden. No one can ever visit Eden. It has to be imagined. And then the challenge for the artist is to convey that imagination to the, um, the reader. And that's done through this loco descriptive approach. Um, it's interesting, and this is where Milton's um, 
ideology comes into play. So we saw that throughout Christian history, there's this dualism shot through, right? Earth is different than heaven. That's a metaphysical realm. It's entirely different. And then there's this other place, hell, that's entirely different, which we haven't really talked much about. Also a metaphysical realm. Nothing changes there, but you don't want to be there because it's all bad all the time for eternity, as opposed to heaven, which is all good all the time for eternity. Um, but Milton is very different than that. He doesn't see either of those as metaphysical realms. Hell, earth, and heaven are all made of the same stuff. He calls one matter all. And the consequence, he can use his loco descriptive technique to describe, you know, plants, streams, mountains, animals, all sorts of things exist in these places because they're all the same kind of place. And that's a radical idea because heaven is supposed to be a completely different place, as is hell. Um, and here is Milton's true radical Christian thinking. He imagines that, okay, what if the fall didn't happen? Okay, we know the fall the fall screwed everything up. We know human beings are, are all going to die now unless we're saved by Jesus. Many people, most people assumed, Christians in this period, that the whole earth was going to decay and burn in the end and all animals and plants and everything. But what if the fall didn't happen? What if Adam and Eve had not transgressed, had not made that original sin? Milton says what God originally wanted to happen, and he can say that because it doesn't say it's not going to happen in Genesis. Genesis doesn't get into the subject at all. Genesis says what happened when the fall took place. It talks about that, but not about hypothetical if the fall didn't place, didn't take place. And Milton says earth would have been changed to heaven and heaven to earth. In other words, the boundary between earth and heaven would have dissolved and this place, this earth, this physical realm would have become heaven, just as heaven, that other realm would have become earth. So there's no metaphysical, physical difference. There's no dualism. It's monism, but monism, not just like of the body where your spirit and, and um, body are melded together into one thing, like many modern people might think, but no, the, the earth and heaven are the same. So it's, it's really radical thinking. And, and according to Milton, you know, prove him wrong. I mean, this is his reading of Genesis, prove him wrong. And most people, by the way, accepted this. It's a, it's a radical document, but when Paradise Lost was, was published, it kind of sent shock waves through, um, through literature and, and religion because it was just such a monumental work and it lasted for well over a hundred years and having that kind of import. And, um, yeah, no one challenged Milton on that for the most part. They just um, said, maybe he's right. Pun Appleton House is what you didn't read, and um, it's, it's okay that you didn't. It's a long poem by Andrew Marvel, and it's the last country house poem. You notice I put it in parentheses there. It's actually a country estate poem, really, the last one. There are going to be some later. I mentioned here Alexander Pope will write something called Windsor Forest. But for the most part, Amelia Lanier and Ben Johnson inaugurated this country estate genre, lasted about 40 years, and ends with this one upon Appleton House. Um, also highly descriptive. So this local descriptive thing that we see with, um, you know, Denham's Cooper's Hill is here alive and well too. It's far more important here. And you can see why this will lead to subsequent nature poetry. When we get to Wordsworth, which we're gonna do very quickly, not today, but you'll see this, this took off like wildfire and already here you have it. And even though the, the issue here is Marvel is also writing a country house poem because, or country estate poem, he has to write it for a patron. And the patron owns this property, um, it's Appleton House, and he's going to write a poem about it because if he wants to get money from patron, his patron, patron's name is Fairfax, he has to do that. So it's interesting. I mean, you, could, you can tell these poems right off the bat. You can tell they're local descriptive in a way because the titles tell about, it, it literally names the place. It's not, you know, um, Amelia Lanyard's The Description of Cookham doesn't say this this group of women and what they were doing, the focus is on the place. Cookham, the focus is on the place. Penshurst, the focus is on the place upon Appleton House. Um, 
And I note here, they're going to be much bigger. This one is six times longer. Just the way Catherine Phillips, when she did Horace the Second Epoch, she added those 20 lines. Well, here, you know, Marvel is going to make this much, much longer to include all those descriptions. So this is kind of, I don't know what I'd call it, like a missing link, a hybrid maybe, I don't know. But it's definitely a country house poem, more accurately country estate, because it is being written by way of patronage. But also, it's moving toward lush, loco-descriptive poetry. And so it's an important link in nature writing. Um, but we're very clear, it's, it's one of those things we've dealt with ever since we've had pastoral, that they're also allegorical. So at this period of time, the Catholic Church um, has been kind of out of England for 100 years because England set up its own church, the Christian Church, the Church of England, there's a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment, and that shows up in here. Really vicious things here, like Catholic nuns are all lesbians, um, and it weighs in on the Civil War and a whole range of things. So um, it's, it's allegorical and, un, and unpleasantly so, for sure. Um, it's also kind of a middling uh, document because even though he's going to talk about, look at like wilderness here, also it has a view of how humanity should interact with nature. And so Thomas Fairfax, the guy who owns the estate, um, was actually very important in the English Civil War. Many people thought he was going to become the next leader of England, um, but he ultimately decided not to do that. Um, so anyhow, he goes into uh, off to his country estate, and according to Marvel, he rules it like a general, you know, and you see all these plants here that um, beating the Dian with its drums, the bee through all these known works, allies hums, and then flowering their uh, drowsy eyelids raise their silken ends in each displays and dries its pan yet dank with dew. And then at the end, as their governor goes by in fragrant volleys, they let fly. So what's that all about? Well, imagine a military parade as, or some sort of military ceremony as this person, this general, which he is, walks by, they get like a 21 gun salute. You have the people shooting off their guns doing it. Well, he rules his garden like a military thing. So he walks through and all the flowers, they let burst their, their flowers. So they like pop open in, in reference, in deference to him. So totally anthropocentric. Um, also just disturbingly militaristic, right? I mean, is that the way we really want to interact with nature, that we are totally in control of it, and that, you know, nature is there for us? Amelia Lanyer was certainly anthropocentric. She has, you know, the, the hills, the dales, the valleys, on as if on bended knee, um, bowing to her. But here, same basic idea, but ramping it up even more, and with the disturb disturbing, I would argue, military Imagery. Um, let's do our next eye clicker problem question. Do you find this material boring? That's the question. Um, and I am, so what do I mean by that? The early modern things we've been reading, certainly Shakespeare, Milton, between them, Amelia Lanyer, Catherine Phillips, Ben Johnson, Andrew Marvel. Um, and I know I know it's kind of a hard question because I know you might like some of them, like Amelia Lanyard. It's like, how do you not like Amelia Lanyard? But on the other hand, there's it's a mixed bag. Um, a little boring. There you go. Basically boring. Um, and hey, thanks to those 35 people. Utterly fascinating stuff. Um, again, I didn't pick it to be fascinating, right? I picked it to be important. And you can see a text like this is um, important for sure. So this is why Marvel's a mixed bag. And in the same way that he sort of has one foot being a country house poem, on the other hand, he has, um, he's, he's, he's part of the future insofar as it really is local descriptive literature, the same type that will emerge full blown when we get to Wordsworth and Thoreau. And even though he has Fairfax controlling this garden like a military general, um, on the other hand, and this is kind of new, that he's really talking about 
old growth forest and wilderness here, and he's celebrating it. Um, he calls it this, this, um, this yet green yet growing arc where the first carpenter might best fit timber for his keel have pressed and where all creatures might have shares. So this is like the, where Adam might have been. Adam is the first carpenter. Um, and it's this beautiful wilderness area. That little line here, these few lines here will be full blown when we get to people like Thoreau who just over the top celebrate wilderness. So to Thoreau, it was just antithetical that he would think of himself like a general controlling, um, you know, Walden Pond, like a military leader. But as much as, you know, Marvel can imagine that, he's also hinting at what's going to come, a new way of thinking and you know hey he had to he had to get money from his patron he has to play up the fact that fairfax is this important general um so he does that but again you can see the beginning of something that'll be full-blown into what most of us think of as nature poetry what you might have thought of as nature poetry before the the class began even um and that what I just said makes clear that, you know, environmental attitudes are in flux here. So yeah, there's this older military control, anthropocentrism. We already saw it with Amelia Lanyer. Here it's it's even more full-blown, but at the same time, we see a celebration of wilderness and the merit of wilderness. And that is by no means anthropocentric. By the time we get to Thoreau, he's going to make a shot at describing what ecocentrism would be like. In other words, if you had a, a place, a forest, for example, and you had someone living there, like Thoreau, he thinks of himself as just one of many beings there. He's the only human being, but there are many beings there. There's many other, you know, plants and animals and things like that. And Thoreau says that's the way we should inhabit a place. So is that what Marvel is saying here about, you know, uh, Fairfax? No. But it's the beginning of that kind of attitude. So um, I know we're flying through this, but this what we're going to do now is going to slow us down a little. Um, still looking at the um, writings of, of, it's not John Marvel, by the way, it's Andrew Marvel. It's a typo. But something called mower poems that Marvel wrote, which are in the reader and which you should read. So I'm going to walk through those poems here. Um, just as a kind of an overview, a teaser as to what's to come, these poems are milestones because they express an uneasiness toward modification of the environment. We see that today, right? Um, and, and maybe one of the best examples of where we feel uneasiness is with the modification of, of life itself by like DNA modification. And, um, you know, that's something that a lot of people have issue with, but um, it's, it's actually um, irrelevant. It's, the discussion has, has actually was settled probably about the time you were born. What do I mean by that? People are worried about eating genetically modified food, for example. You'll see continuing protests in parts of like Europe, for example. But in the US, there was a law passed, again, about the time you were, most people in the room were born, which says that um, when you buy food, when you look at the label and it says, you know, where, uh, how much, you know, um, fat it has or fiber or whatever, it does not have to say if it's genetically modified. And why that's important is because it doesn't say it, you've all been eating genetically modified food probably all your lives. 90% of all corn in the US, 90, over 90% of all corn, over 90% of all soybeans, over 90% of all wheat in the US is genetically modified. It's GMO, it's genetically modified organisms. And not only have you probably eaten GMOs in the last 24 hours, um, there's a good chance you're wearing GMOs now because over 90% of cotton grown in the US or the other big sources like India are genetically modified too. So this is still a, ser a source of anxiety now in the 21st, but this modification of the environment, the anxiety it brought about was alive and well with um, Andrew Marvel. So let me explain how that works. And it's a good general overview of what anxiety like that would be. 
So um, this is the mower against gardens. I'm going to literally walk through this line after line. And again, it's in the reader. Luxurious bring his vice and use did after him the world seduce. And from the fields, the flowers and plants allure where nature was most plain and pure. So what's he doing there? He's starting off celebrating wilderness where nature was most plain and pure. What does that mean? Untouched by human beings, where that's, you know, where human beings hadn't started meddling. And now the poem is going to take off and be very critical of the meddling that's been done. So what do people do? Um, he, meaning mankind or humankind, uh, first enclosed within the garden square, a dead and standing pool of air. So he's going to be talking about gardens that wealthy people had, the sort of gardens that were um, railed against in depends her. So if you had a big estate, you have that big trophy house, sure. But then you have like what's called a pleasure garden. It was kind of riffing on an Italian form. And how do you make that garden? The first thing you do is you put a wall around it to protect it. And um, he first enclosed the garden where a dead and standing pool of air. So the first thing that people have done that's a problem is to build an enclosed garden like that. And that should, uh, you know, kind of remember, make you remember back to the Epic of Gilgamesh, where that's the issue. The whole city had been enclosed inside of uh, these walls, and there was a celebration of what was inside. Here, Marvel was saying, the problem is what's inside is cut off from nature. It's no longer pure nature. And let me explain why, because he's he talks about it in detail here. First off, First problem, once you build the wall, what do you do in the garden? A more lustrous earth for them did need, which stupefied them while it fed. Um, so I'll just I'll go through the line here, and then I'll come back to it. The pink grew then as double his mind, the nutriment did change the kind. So what's this all about? Again, a concern at the time that people were actually modifying the soil itself. So in a forest, in wilderness, nothing you know there's no intervention everything is the way it is leaves fall on the ground they compost they become you know the nutriment nutrient that feeds the plants well in this period of time people are beginning to do things like composting in a really big way and a more lustrous earth for them did need so people were actually working in more organic material into the soil and modifying the soil now to us in the 21st this doesn't seem like a problem that's a cornerstone of organic farming compost as well it makes it works because we don't want to use, you know, uh, fossil fuel derived um, fertilizers. But to Marvel's way of thinking, this is a problem because it is a modification of the earth. The argument is we shouldn't be meddling with it. Um, we say this in the 21st, we say like, you know, we shouldn't meddle with nature. We shouldn't change nature. This was a divine mandate for Marvel being a Christian. And the idea here is not that you shouldn't meddle with nature the way, because we would say, you know, nature has evolved in a certain way. It has created these very complex ecosystems. They're in a great sense of balance or they're self-regulating in any event. So we shouldn't mess with them. Um, Orville's coming from a different perspective because he's a creationist and he believes, well, God created things this way. God created the forest this way. We should not meddle with it. God wanted it to be this way. Don't mess with it. So it's the same basic idea. And the, 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 it's curious that we have that notion that continues forward to allow for evolution. But anyhow, um, so um, the pink grew then as double as his mind, the nutriment to change the kind. With strange perfumes, the roses taint and flowers themselves were taught to paint. So what's going on here? Well, how is this environment being changed? First, you put all that compost there, the pink grew then double in his mind. Plants are growing bigger and all. You give them a lot of you know, fertilizer in the form of organic compost, they're going to grow more and more. And that nutriment, he argues, is actually changing the very essence of a plant. But he's got any, and you might say, well, how is it actually changing? Well, he's got the answer here. With strange perfumes, he did the roses taint. So here's where what's in essence genetic modification comes into play. 
They did not have, you know, CRISPR-Cas9 technology to create GMOs back then. But what they did have was, as you know, probably from high school, selective breeding. And they did have enough understanding of genetics um, that they were able to selectively breed flowers to do certain things. And he says, for example, uh, strange perfumes, he did the roses taint. The argument here, and, and he's, he's right, if you look at the earliest um, roses before human beings started, you know, selectively breeding them, they didn't really smell very much at all. Human beings now have, however, taught the roses with, and with, to make their own strange perfumes. So what's that about? You selectively breed roses to smell better. You breed flowers to smell better. That's one of the goals of this breeding project is to genetically modify them through, again, selective breeding or maybe like kind of hybridization. But you could then do that so that you would get the exact smell you want or in particular a rose that would smell better because everyone likes the smell of roses. And how else are we genetically modifying them? Flowers themselves were taught to paint. What does that mean? Well, you know, the original rose came basically in one color. But what he does, what he's arguing is um, this at this period of time, they were selectively breeding roses in all sorts of colors. If you wonder why, you can get roses today, not just red, but you can get pink, you can get yellow, you can get white, you can get, you know, have a blush of color on the outside. Where did all that come from? None of that's natural in the sense that none of it was there before human beings modified it. This has been going on, as Marvel makes clear, you know, he's writing here uh, 350 years ago, more 370 years ago, that all this has been done for centuries. We've been modifying these plants. All the plants that you eat basically have been modified. You may not realize it, but, you know, um, corn, you know, those large ears of corn, you know, the original ears of corn were like like this long, you know, they were they're tiny. They've been selectively modified over the centuries to have characteristics that we want. Marvel here, and you can see where this dovetails with him, you know, celebrating wilderness in a Pon Appleton house, is saying, that makes me uneasy. I do not think that human beings should modify the environment. Look what they're, and, and it, he could have talked about, you know, um, cultivars of plants like I just did with corn and how it's been changing. Um, but he wants to talk about the silly reason for it, right? Because you can make the argument, well, corn was a really great thing, you know, feeds people and all, it should have been modified. You can make the argument. He's saying, is this the silliest thing in the world? We've changed flowers and made all these changes so they smell a different way or so they're in different colors. Um, and again, he's anx made anxious by it. The tulip white did for complexion seek and learned to interline its cheek, its onion root. They then so high did hold that one was for a meadow sold. So um, tulips were not naturally white. This was a um, kind of like an, uh, a race at the time to, to, to make a white tulip took an enormous amount of selective breeding to do so um, with sort of an inner line color on the side of it. And when that was done, that became incredibly valuable and important. It was done in Holland where they you know, were doing the most genetic modification there. And as you, if you may know, if you're into gardening tulips, you don't plant a seed for a tulip. You use a bulb. Have you ever seen a bulb that you put in the ground in a garden, and it becomes something like a tulip. It looks kind of like an onion, you know? Um, and so it's onion root, they so high did hold that one was for a meadow sold. And the idea here is that these wealthy folks who own these, you know, McMansions and have these amazing gardens, they wanna have these incredibly interesting flowers to prove that they're wealthy. And if you had a white tulip, it's so valuable that you would have to sell a whole meadow. So what would that be in like today's terms? You'd have to sell a meadow, a piece of ground and maybe get 30 or $40,000 or I don't know, some such number. And that's what it would cost to buy one of these special um, white tulips. They were that rare at the time. And this was actually, we know this is true, it was a headline at the at the time that someone actually paid an incredible amount for, for one um, tulip. 
It's not the only thing that people are doing at the time. Another world was searched, and by another world, read in this terms, the new world, meaning the Americas. The Americas were searched through oceans new, and we didn't even realize there was an ocean between you know, Europe and the Americas, to find the marvel of Peru. Marvel of Peru, you wouldn't know this reference, but it's a plant from the period. So it's bad enough that people are genetically modifying these things, but also now colonial project is well underway. We're bringing things from all over the world to England. And that project was absolutely huge. So in the year 1500, the beginning of what we're calling the early modern period here, there were probably about 200 introduced species in England. So things might have come from, like, from other places. There were, you know, there was trade going on with like India and all the time, but only 200 introduced species. By the year 1700, and we're just 50 years away from this, it would go from 200 to 20,000. So species were being introduced from all over the world into England, and uh, we're going to see it when we get to Herbert in a minute. People are really worried about the indigenous plants, what what's going to happen to the natives, and Herbert is going to rail against that in a minute. But here, uh, Marvel is more concerned about all these, you know, introduced things that were being brought to um, to England. And, and some of them, again, I think he would have had trouble arguing against. So um, the potato, for example, was brought to England. And that was it was huge. It came from the Americas. It became a subsistence crop so that you can have just like an acre of ground and you can grow enough calories in any event to, to feed a small family there with potatoes. Um, it was Raleigh, Walter Raleigh, who actually did that. So that's it's hard to rail against. There are other things that people were really upset by. Um, King James, who was the sovereign after Elizabeth, was very upset by tobacco. Also probably brought by Walter Raleigh. Raleigh. And that's a huge problem. Um, I mentioned there's this air pollution problem. People are dying from respiratory illness. They're also beginning to die from tobacco, too. So tobacco, which was used as like the ceremonial drug, basically, in the Americas rather infrequently, then becomes, you know, as we now know, abused in the uh, uh, in Europe and the West. So if you wonder where tobacco came from, its, it's history in the West is only about 400 years old. And yet, these rarities might be allowed. So in other words, we might even allow the genetic modification of flowers. We might even allow, you know, bringing in all these, you know, non-natives. Uh, might be allowed to man, to human beings, that sovereign thing and proud. So a nice little jab here at humanity. We are this sovereign thing. We're proud. We think we're so special. Um, had he not dealt between the bark and tree, forbidden mixtures there to see. No plant now knew the stock from which it came. He grafts upon the wild, the tame. So what this is a reference to is grafting. Another, not genetic modification, but it's a structural modification of plants. Um, you may know this. It's um, You can actually go to like a plant nursery today here in Santa Barbara and buy a tree, an apple tree, put it in your backyard, and it would have three main um, branches coming off of the of the um, uh, main root. And one would give you red apples, like a Fuji. One would give you a yellow apple, um, like an opal apple. One would give you a green apple, like a Granny Smith. How is that possible? Because those are three different varieties of apples. How could you grow them off of one tree? Well, um, it, it had been known for hundreds of years. It's even mentioned in the New Testament, the Christian Testament of the Bible. There's this method called grafting. And what you can do with grafting is you get rootstock, you, you cut off a tree, and you have just the root that's in the ground. And if you do it correctly, you can put a branch off of three different trees on there, a red apple, a green apple, and a yellow apple. And if you, you know, do it carefully and, and watch after it, it will then grow to become that. And this was being used to great effect in this period because they had these older kind of apple trees, kind of like crab apple trees that were all over England, and they had used them to create hedges between farms. So if your farm is one place you wanted to have a fence between someone else, you didn't have to build a wall, you didn't have to build a fence, you put in these trees. The problem is these apple trees, they, they didn't produce anything of any use, but someone realized very quickly you could cut them all off, use the rootstock there, and put on 
modern apples that would, in fact, um, you know, be usable. You could eat them and all. All this is getting Marvel very anxious. And it makes clear that in this period, there's just an anxiety about human beings changing nature. The, the preference, the knee-jerk preference that you see with Marvel here is to say, no, we shouldn't be doing this. This is, this is wrong. This is not, and again, in Marvel's language, this is not what God ordained. God didn't create this. If we want it, you know, if God wanted there to be an apple that could grow three different kind of apples from one tree, God would have created that. What, what are we doing here? And again, that's live and well in the 20th and 21st, where you hear people, hear people saying, well, why are we genetically modifying these crops? This is not, this is not, quote, natural. Marvel did not think it natural. Um, that the uncertain and adulterated fruit, um, fruit might put the palate in dispute. So, He's now talking about, you know, fruit, okay, it's not that like a flower, it smells different or looks different, but here actually it's confusing because it tastes different than you'd imagine. Everybody knows what an apple tastes like, but now suddenly you have apples that don't taste like apples at all. So Marvel, yeah, very worried about genetic modification. Um, here's a question. Do you find this? So Marvel, the answer that Marvel would have to this, do you find the way the human beings relate to plants and animals troubling? Marvel would say, yeah, really troubling in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, do you find it troubling? Because guess what? We've really, really ramped this up in the 20th, 20th century with, with hybridization and then the 21st with GMOs or genetic modification. So do you find that troubling or is it okay? Just curious. And by the way, this is, it's even now the tip of the iceberg, right? So um, well, let me just, before I, you know, tell you um, what's the problem, generally speaking, uh, or a little, so everybody, most people are a little concerned about it, uh, only like one in 10 people are, are not. So you may know that this is, this even now with genetic modification, even though I said everything about all the, you know, the wheat and the soybeans and corn and all their genetic modified, there's a whole new, and if you're interested in, you know, biology or um, ecology, um, the whole new field called uh, um, selective evolution and, and directed evolution more generally. And directed evolution, um, human beings, the argument is human beings should now, in various ways, and maybe in a really big way, take control of evolution on the planet. So evolution has been working in a certain way all along, but now we need to step in and modify that. And why do we need to do it? Well, basically because of the problems we brought about. So in other words, the climate crisis has brought a period of a mega drought to the western part of North America, extending not just in the U.S., but down to other countries like El Salvador and all. So... Should we just let that happen because plants are going to die because of that species are going to go extinct and all? Or should we step in and genetically modify those species to be more drought tolerant? Or should we step in and genetically modify those species to be good at sequestering carbon? So you may know the biggest, you know, the number one greenhouse gas is, of course, CO2. Plants, of course, uh, bring CO2 into their bodies and it stays in their bodies until they decay unless you can keep it from decaying, and that's what happens when they fall underwater, um, uh, which is what happened that led to the creation of fossil fuels 100 million years ago. But you can also sequester that CO2 by having plants with a great root system that puts the CO2 literally underground in roots that won't decay. You know, should we be selectively modifying plants to do that, to sequester the CO2 that we put in the atmosphere? If you could do it with enough plants, you could pull all the CO2 in the atmosphere out. And, and by the way, just as a little um, signpost here, in this period in time, the um, amount of CO2 in the atmosphere on the planet was about 280 parts per million. It had stayed at 280 parts per million and went up and down a little, but basically for many tens of thousands of years. This is the period, as we saw, where England is burning these fossil fuels, where it starts going up. Why? Because we're putting emissions in the atmosphere. We're also cutting down forests. Right now, we're at 420 parts per million. 
Um, so that has gone up a dramatic amount um, over, you know, like 140 points. Um, and the amazing thing about that, by the way, even though it's interesting to look at this period, even though it begins in this period, all the emissions for the most part happened relatively recently. Since, well, there's a period we call 1945 onward, it's called the Great Acceleration. 85% um, of all emissions got put there. So it's rather astonishing to think about because you have people living, I'm talking about the generation of you know, um, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, 85% um, of the climate crisis was caused by that one generation, in that one generation's time. So it's astonishing to think about, you know, humanity was going okay for a long time, and then it just all fell apart in, in one generation, which is really utterly remarkable if you just meditate on that for a while. Okay. <laughs> So, Man by George Herbert. I told you this is going to be a short lecture. Um, George Herbert was, you know, anxious about the loss of indigenous plants. So he writes this little poem called Man. And this is from that poem, which is not in the reader, but these are the relevant sections here anyhow. More servants wait on man than he'll take, tread, uh, take notice of, and every path he treads down that which doth befriend him when sickness makes him pale and wane. O oh, mighty love, herbs gladly cure our flesh because they find their acquaintance there. So what's this? You may have heard this argument, actually. It emerged again, so this is, you know, 350 plus years ago, but it emerged again in the 1980s. And what people argued was, because at that time there was a big focus on the loss of rainforests, which amazingly has continued on for the last 40 years. But anyhow, there was a big concern about it, especially in the Amazon basin. And one of the arguments made was, yeah, yeah, it causes climate change and all that, and we shouldn't be deforesting. But, you know, there's so many species of plants there what if, and this is how it was phrased at the time, what if the cure to cancer is in the Amazonian basin and we are cutting it down and eradicating it and destroying it? I mean, it was a simplistic view. We don't think of cancer simply like that. Nowadays, it's like one disease, but that was the idea at the time. But anyhow, Herbert had that notion 350 years ago that, you know, in every path, he treads down that which doth befriend him when sickness makes him pale and wane. So in other words, when you're sick and pale, you need something to make you better. You want a medicine. You're treading down things that could actually be made into medicine. We are literally trampling them down. And that was the flip side of the argument that Marvel makes, because Marvel was worried about the fact that we went from 200 indigenous species to two, to 20,000 in two centuries. You know, what? why are we bringing all these new plants into uh, to England, which is this little island, you know, system? And Herbert says, yeah, yeah, that's a problem, but what about the loss of natives? All these natives are being supplanted. We didn't think they had any value, but maybe they do. We know that there are many medicinal herbs on the plant on, in England. What if there are more that we just haven't figured out yet? We're destroying them. These, the closing lines here, these herbs gladly cure our flesh because they find their acquaintance there. This was kind of a medical theory at the time that it was thought that herbs worked on a certain part of the body because they sort of zoomed into them because they were like genetically similar. But anyhow, um, he's very worried about the loss of indigenous species. So um, this is the fourth one we've had today, isn't it? Third? Third? Okay, let's do it anyhow. Um, do you find the way that human beings relate to plants and animals troubling? So both Marvel and Herbert certainly did in different ways. And it becomes, you know, this will go flying forward and we're going to go flying forward next into the um, later period. So, um, hey, I told you we'd finish early and darn if we didn't. Uh, let's see. Um, generally speaking, but not very interesting. Okay. Um, I was going to say you could all leave, but you're all leaving. So, okay, that's it. Have a great weekend. See you next week. We do have class on Tuesday, even though we don't on Thursday, because, you know, that's Thanksgiving.
Okay. Hold on. 